I need to set for you the text that I'm about to read, because we have been jumping to different parts in the life of Jacob and his family. Last week we talked about how Joseph, the Joseph with the fancy coat, was done in or sold into slavery by his brothers. He ends up being carted off to Egypt, uh, and uh, his father is left with the story that his son has died being eaten by animals. Now, what happens between that story and this story, I'm going to tell you right now. Joseph is taken as a slave into the court of Pharaoh. In Pharaoh's court, uh, he goes through an accusation, is thrown in jail, but a talent that he has he, you know, comes to the fore. This talent is his ability to understand and to interpret dreams. You'll recall last week when I read the text, it said, Joseph was a dreamer. And that's what his brothers accused him of being. Well, Joseph, the dreamer, interprets a dream that Pharaoh has. And the interpretation you might be familiar with, it is seven years of abundance when the crops will grow, and then seven, seven years of famine. Uh, the seven years of abundance, you know, Egypt, under uh, Joseph's leadership, you know, with the approval of Pharaoh, they stored up grain. And they literally became the grain uh, you know, provider for the Middle East and for the Mediterranean world. The seven years of famine, however, uh, other nations did not have that store of grain, and so they became dependent upon Egypt. We are now two years into the famine when the text begins. Jacob, remember Jacob? Uh, he has sent his sons to Egypt to appeal to Pharaoh to, you know, for some food to feed his family. Unbeknownst to Jacob's uh, sons, Joseph is now uh, the prime minister, if you will, of Egypt and meets these uh, sons of Jacob, his brothers. They don't recognize him. Uh, and uh, you know, suddenly, uh, how do I put it, the shoe is on the other foot. Uh, Joseph then plays or toys with his brothers, sending them back and forth. And finally, you know, we come to the part where Joseph is about to reveal himself to his brothers. He's about you know, to tell them the jig is up. This is his chance to get back. Listen. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed, were they at his presence? Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. They came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, and go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come. 
so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and that all of you have, been, have seen. Hurry, bring my father down here. And then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And while Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers spoke to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, this is the last one. The last in this series of sermons I've called the Jacob Chronicles. The story of Jacob and his family is about to come to a conclusion. During these last five weeks, I've attempted to show how these ancient stories, some of the oldest in the Bible, are really quite contemporary. Today's chronicle is no different. I'd like to stretch our imagination, our understanding a bit, by resetting this story in the 21st century. The story of Joseph reuniting with his brothers is one that I have pondered for a while. And I've often wondered, how does this story speak today, to us today? What does it say to us? What is at the heart of this story for me and for you? What's going on in Joseph's mind when he at last confronted with his brothers who sold him to slavery? What's he thinking? What would I be thinking? Why did he forgive? And what would forgiveness look like today? These are the questions that come out of this chronicle. A while back, I began to write a series of short stories with the hope of someday putting them all together in a book. It's not a book. But the stories, I still tell. Why? Because stories, narratives, are the foundation of truth. Consider, when Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven, when he talked about things theological, he did not use ideas. He did not use the Greek philosophical language, no. He told stories, simple agricultural stories to tell about the kingdom of God. And so first, a little bit about the story I'm about to tell you. The main character in this story is a minister. You should always write what you know they say. His name is Thomas P. Skilden. Well, Tom grew up in an eastern city. Once again, you should always write about what you know. And after seminary, he was an associate pastor in a large church in Chicago, where he was mentored by a fine pastor and it soon, after seven or eight years, it soon became time for him to spread his wings and find a church of his own to serve. In Chicago, he met his wife, Carol. They have two children. And now we find him, eight years later, settling in as the solo pastor who received a call from a small Midwestern village in Missouri. This is the setting for my fables. Now, a word about Tom. He has never lived in a village. He has never lived in suburbia. He does not know what a lawnmower is. The first story that I wrote, which you won't hear, is a story about how he ruined his lawn in two short weeks by overfeeding it. He has no idea of what to do in this suburban community. He has no clue about the norms, the values, that suburban and village people have. And consequently, he finds himself tripping all over himself as he goes about loving and ministering to his people. Tom, like most ministers, makes mistakes. And he constantly tries to juggle between the pressures of home and work. The events of his life are often humorous, but humor only in retrospect. The stories are, on one level, ordinary, perhaps amusing. But for those who are willing to listen and contemplate them, I think they offer insight into living with the gospel message in our day. 
This was a second story in the series that I wrote. And it's based upon the text that I just read to you. Listen. It was August of Tom's first year at Prince of Peace Presbyterian Church. The Reverend Thomas P. Skillman, or Pastor Tom, had an interesting vacation. The formless void of space and time that was before him was filled with a number of household chores and also travels. The lawn, which Tom almost managed to destroy, was on its way to recovery. And he was back at the church, settling all the problems, all the little crises that occurred during his two-week absence. His neighbor, William P. Jones, who always said, just call me Jonesy, the one with the immaculate lawn, was becoming a bit warmer toward Tom, especially since his lawn was looking better. Tom even borrowed an edger from him, learned how to use it, and got to know him even better. Let's back up just one week. Tom recently finished his vacation. He and Carol had an opportunity to go on their first vacation together without the kids, by themselves. This was the first one since the children were born. And so they headed north and rented a cottage on Lake Michigan. They stayed there for two wonderful, idyllic weeks. On the way home, they stopped in Illinois for Carol's family reunion. Now, Tom dearly loved his wife, Carol, but that love was in direct proportion to his dislike for family reunions. You see, dear listener, at a family reunion, at any gathering, a minister is still a minister, maybe more so. Tom had become the unofficial pastor, the family chaplain, if you will, to Carol's entire family. And the group that gathered at the Grange Hall in rural Illinois numbered well over 100. Overwhelming. Carol's family had never gotten over the novelty that she married a clergyman. And Tom knew that this family reunion would be punctuated by a number of awkward conversations. He knew that he would hear someone come up to him and say, gee, it must be great to work only one hour a week. Three people came up and said that to him. And then there would be someone who come up who would come up and say, have you heard the one about the rabbi, the priest, and the minister? And Tom would grin and bear it, wishing that there was a joke that he could tell that began, there was a banker, a teacher, and an electrician. About halfway through the day-long event, working on his lawn and the other chores that awaited him in Missouri seemed inviting. The reunion was hard work. Tom survived the ordeal. And he and Carol arrived home on Wednesday. He had to preach on Sunday, but quite frankly, he was not feeling very old. And yeah, ministers have those days. And Thursday, he was out working on his lawn. William, call me Jonesy Jones, came out, and the two started visiting. Jonesy was about the same age as Tom, but his receding hairline made him look a bit older. Summer's almost over, he told Tom. Did you have a good trip? A question like this seldom requires more than a, yes, it was great. But Tom, not having a confidant, someone to talk to, and still recovering from his family reunion, responded honestly and shared his tale of woe, complete with the bad jokes of the three people who said, you only work one week. Jones listened intently, and then he said, why don't you join me for an iced tea on the deck, and I'll tell you about my family reunion. And so they settled in. Jonesy started his tale. I haven't had a family since I was 16. What happened? Tom asked. An accident? No, it wasn't an accident. It was done on purpose. Tom was befuddled. But Jonesy kept with the tale. When I was 15, my older brothers got involved with the wrong group, and they were stealing auto parts. They stored their loot in the garage, but eventually the police caught up with them. My three older brothers were all over 18, and they knew that they would go to jail for what they did. 
And so they fabricated a story blaming me. Maybe they thought because I was 15, I wouldn't get into big trouble. It didn't help that I protested my innocence because the judge thought it sounded like a lack of remorse for my crime. And so right before my 16th birthday, I was sent to a youth correctional facility. As they took me away, I swore that someday I'd get back. I spent eight months there, and then I was sent out to foster homes. The foster homes, oh, they were okay, but they weren't home. And yet I was so angry, so mad, I never wanted to see my brothers again. My foster parents owned a small accounting firm, and I helped out. Computers were just coming out then, and I persuaded them to buy one, and I worked on a program it. And soon their business doubled because of a program that I wrote that enabled them to do more work. They were so appreciative that they sent me to college. And after I graduated, I got the job at the bank. Tom interrupted at this point with a question. You're the vice president there now, aren't you? Jonesy nodded and continued. Life has been good to me. I've got a good job, wonderful life. Our three children bring a great deal of joy to me. But whenever anyone asks about my father or my childhood family, I would feel anger, a deep rage. I would go into a blue funk. Josie got up, took the glasses, went into the kitchen, refilled them, and came out again on the deck, handed Tom a fresh glass of iced tea, and continued. A month ago, I was processing loans. There in the middle of the stack was a loan needed by a small family business. They came upon hard times and needed some capital to retool their machine shop. Pathetic application. They had so very little inventory, no collateral, a poor business plan, and their books, well, what I could understand was awful. I looked at the background of the owners, and I noticed that their name was Jones also. 99% of the time, I would have rejected the loan on the spot as too risky. But I had my assistant start a file for them. I wanted more information. I told them what I, that I wanted credit checks on the three owners of the business, and she got it. And then my hunch was confirmed. They were my brothers. They were the ones who sold me out. They were the ones who made me pay for their evil. And now they needed something, and I was the one who had what they wanted. Faith had brought us together again. But the tables were reversed. The chickens had come home to roost. Justice would be mine at last. It was payback time. But first, I wanted to play with them. I wanted to toy with them. The loan didn't stand a chance. It would never pass the committee. But I was going to play. I was going to make them scrape together every paper I could conceivably think of. I wanted them believing that they would get that loan. And so I had them running back and forth to the bank every other day with this paper and that paper, this document and that. And then the day of reckoning was near. I had played with them for a few weeks. And it was now time to tell them that their loan was rejected. But more, I wanted to tell them exactly who was rejecting it. I would get back at last. Tom minced at these words, get back. But in truth, he knew the power of anger, revenge, and that desire that is within all of us to get back. Tom didn't say a word, and Josie continued the story of his family reunion. They came in the room. I pulled out their file. Then I looked at them carefully and said, do you have any other family members? They looked at me and mumbled something about an elderly father. And then they said something about a brother who ran away from home. Sounded plausible. I shook my head. And then introduced myself to them again. 27 years had gone by. I said tersely, 
Did he run away or did you sell him out? And they looked at me and recognition came over their faces. They broke into tears and then I did. The day of judgment was here and I was bawling like a baby. I could not tell them that there was no loan for them. Instead, I arranged to loan the funds to them myself. I hope they make it. I really hope they make it. It was some family reunion. Found him home that afternoon. He had a lot of time to think about reunions. His family reunion, Josie's and the others. He recalled again the story of Joseph meeting his brothers who sold him into slavery and the strange mystery of grace and forgiveness. Revenge is a powerful drive that comes upon us. It motivates us to great heights and accomplishments, but it ultimately demands our soul and it destroys it. Grace is that mysterious moment in time and space when we let go of that primal drive, that drive to get even, that drive to get back. All reunions, family and otherwise, are characterized by grace. Why? Because they're made up of people thrown together by chance and by genetics. People who know each other's flaws and weaknesses. People who know each other's sins. And somehow, in the midst of that, discover a way to move on together, hand in hand. There is another reunion, which we all face. At the memorial services that Tom and all Presbyterian pastors lead, the prayer contains these words. We look forward to that glad, heavenly reunion. Gladness is a word that typifies all reunions. But that glad heavenly reunion will be one where our brother Jesus is there. There he will meet us, and there he will even sit in judgment. But this same Jesus will also meet the scribes and the Pharisees who tried to trick him. He will meet the Sadducees who had him crucified. He will meet the Pontius Pilate who could have stopped it all but washed his hands of it. He will meet soldier who nailed his hands and legs. He will meet Judas, the one who betrayed him. And like Joseph meeting his brothers who sold him, like Jonesy meeting his brothers who lied and robbed him of his youth, Jesus will be there. And it could certainly be the time when he gets back. But at the heart of our faith is a belief that this moment too will be characterized not by retribution, but by grace. This reunion, too, will be characterized by gracious, forgiving, welcoming love. Tom pondered that story through the evening and knew also that he, too, would experience this welcome and the glad reunion of joy. He rolled over put his arm around his wife of 19 years, Carol, sighed a deep sigh of peace, and went back to sleep. This is the good news. Amen.